So welcome back everyone. I've got a great video for you guys today. Today, we're gonna to be building the ultimate timber garden boxes. So it's about 8.30 on Tuesday morning, getting an early start. I got up this morning at about five and have been sawmilling all morning to get everything ready for this project. And this is the first timber that we're working on. So let's go over here and take a look at the timbers. So what we have is full dimension Douglas for six by six timbers. Uh, that we're going to be using for the garden box. Now Mrs. W has been using the orchard boxes made out of plywood and we've gotten probably about six years or so but they are starting to well they're just starting to go bad and they have maybe one more season in them so I'm going to start phasing them out with these heavy timber boxes uh, cut from or cut from trees off our pile there from the uh, the Lucas mill. So I'm going to try to do the majority of this work by hand if not all of it and we'll be using a lap joint for the corners which I've got the first one done right there and I'll show you the this these are the tools that I'll be using and this is probably everything that I'm going to need. We'll have a tri square pencil, a couple planes tape measures, inch and a half chisel and of course uh, my saws. This is a new saw here that I'm using for the first time. It is a Japanese timber saw and I'll tell you what, I am in love with it. It is, uh, it was really hard to find. I had to order it out of Japan, um, but it is really great. I like the shape of it. It's real precise and it's really good for shoulder work. And so we'll be using that today too, trying that on. And that's about it. That's the amazing thing about this type of construction, the timber framing or post and beam construction, is you just don't need hardly any tools uh, to do really big work. So this is a project that any one of you guys can do for your wives in the garden. You don't need a sawmill. You can just go to Home Depot or your lumber yard and get six by six timbers. Um, and even if they're only eight foot, you can lap them together. I have, these are gonna be all one piece. I have the luxury of a band saw, or the sawmill, so I can do that. But if I didn't, I would just use eight footers using the same lap joint. So before we get started, we've got a, a We've got to determine uh, a few things about the timber here, and we've got to establish a control. So a control here is a traditional way to mark that as two V's that come together. This means we're gonna pull all of our measurements off of this corner, and that way it'll help us to have square shoulders. Also, I'm gonna identify, it will start with the Roman numeral one. That'll be our first joint. So when we start the assembly, we can put everything in order. We'll be one to one, two to two, three to three, and so on and so forth. Um, let's come inside and we'll show you what we've done so far. Give you, kind of give you an idea of what we're doing. So we're gonna, we're gonna do, this is a uh, 12 by 16 uh, and a, a six inch and we're using these lap joints here. Um, so we've been working on those. So that's turned out really nice and we'll pin and peg all of these things and we're gonna go three courses high. So here's the, uh, we got those two there, this one, Brian's working on the last one, and then I'm working on the sides. Now the cool part, whenever I try to do something, uh, I, I, it's, it's always nice to have some sort of a, a, a detail, something that's just done for no other reason than just to be beautiful. Uh, you were talking about that, Brian. Was yeah, it the I, Swedish guy? The or? Swedish, uh, what's his name, uh, Yogi Sundqvist. Okay. He was saying that when you make something, you know, you take into account all the design details, the ergonomics, right? You know, the material that you're using. But then it's nice to give there something just for the eye. Just for the eye. I, I think that that's just so beautifully put. So we want something just for the eye, so that when Mrs. W looks at it, that she will be impressed. So what we're going to do is, I think, can we draw it on here, right here, kind of. I'll, I'll just retrace it here. So. One thing we have a concern with is that as we put these guys in the ground, uh, we're going to drive rebar into the ground through the bottom course. Now that's going to keep it from spreading. We're going to have a lot of dirt in here, you know, hundreds of pounds of dirt, and it'll act to spread the, these timbers, and we don't want that. So the bottom will be taken care of with the rebar, but the top, once it comes up here, that's going to tend to bow out. So we have a really cool fix here. So what we're going to do is we're going to put a crossbar at six inches and we're gonna let in a dovetail. So it's gonna look something like this here. It will be a pocket here. So it'll sit up, we'll have two inches of, this is called the relish. And then here, this is just for the eye, the dovetail. It's more, it's, it's functional too. And then we'll have a dovetail like this that will sit flush down in there. And what that will do is that will key this whole thing together. And as the wood wants to spread and to press out, those dovetails are really strong 
only way for that to fail is if, if to completely compress and mash the wood, which it won't do. There's just not that much force on it. And it'll have, a, it'll kind of divide the box into two sections. There'll be an eight foot there, an eight foot there. And it's kind of nice. I think Mrs. W likes to have things kind of segregated and it just, I think it ties the whole thing in together. So um, that's it. So let's, we'll, we'll show you the process of doing our last two pieces and then we'll get to work on this. This is something I've never done before. I'm hoping Brian, you know how to do it. No? No. <laughs> we'll have to get the library book back out. So this is our, uh, this is our control side right here. And so what we're gonna do is we're gonna cut this to length. Now when I'm doing this, I'm measuring from this corner only here. And I'm, I'm making sure that my lines are just one single line. Once I'm lined up, I commit, make my line, and those should come together. Now I'm measuring off of this face and this face. It's okay for me to go ahead and do this because as long as I stay on those two faces there. So I'll line that up and then one quick clean line and now we have it. Now the trick to cutting straight that I have found is this. The important thing is all in the setup. So I get set up, make that pull. We're, we don't want to cut on the line. We want to just to the right of the line. We want to leave it. Now, once I get that a quarter established, I'm watching two things. I'm watching here and here. And I'm going down and I'm working down this line and I'm getting a nice straight curve. Following that line, watching up here, and that's it. Now, I've got a pretty straight cut right there. I'm gonna switch sides here and it, it's, I, I'm gonna go right in that curve and I'm just gonna carefully go back, just a light pressure, just following that line. Just following that line right until I hit that corner. Now on this side, and I'm gonna just take at about a 45 and I'm gonna follow that down. Light pressure. The light pressure until I get that kerf established is really important. Now you can see I've got a good even line, both sides, I'll come back over here make Brian's life miserable here in the sun. And the same thing, I'm working down. Once I get that cut down at the top and about halfway down, now I can go into more of a power stroke and cut out that wood in the middle. There we have it. A straight cut like I've never been able to do before. And we have our lines, that's why it's so important for us to leave our lines. And we can just pare that down. You see why it's so important to have sharp tools. So Brian, I need your opinion here. What do you think? Any reason why that won't work? You haven't done enough relief on the bottom yet. Or is it going to go into the other bit? That one inch relief. I need to I need to take some I need to take the corner out, don't I? Yeah, that's a good point. Okay. I don't know how I overlooked that. It's alright, it's not too late. So I was about to cut a corner and Brian shamed me, maybe do the right thing. Well, that's what I'm here for, Cody. And now we've put all this work in here 
and I can't believe at the last minute he was gonna just say, oh, oh no, we can't, oh, just the one little step that's gonna make it just right now, we can't do that. <laughs> Even though it's gonna be under dirt, yeah. but we'll know it's there, so yeah, Brian was right. So this, uh, this is it right here. Oh, it's oh, this just murder to video today. Okay, so uh, this is, here's the, here's the shoulder. This will all come true or clear in a minute. So I was just going to leave this hanging down, but we decided to take that back two feet, put that beautiful detail on there, and I'm so glad. I guess I'm glad that I'm doing it. And I got to do it <laughs> You're on both glad. sides twice. So, <laughs> all right. Well, I, I I'll uh, I'll finish it up here. Oh, I knew it. Oh, butter side up. I was just reaching for it. Did it hit the gravel? It didn't, it didn't look too bad. It looks all right, okay. I, I, oh, I think I can get one more pull. Oh, there we go, that's nice. That's the way it ought to be. Abandoning you. No, you're not abandoning me. You're entrusting me. Entrusting you. <laughs> I've got to go edit this video. Brian is going to uh, continue working on the joints. We've got just a couple more pieces left. And um, tomorrow, I see no reason that, that uh, we can't to get this in the ground. So that will be the next part. So thanks for watching. We'll see you guys in the next video. So first off, I'd like to thank the thousands and thousands of you who have contacted me about um, my last rant video or my last end card with uh, thoughts and prayers and just a tremendous outpouring of support. I was very encouraged. Mrs. W. was encouraged. And I want to thank you for all of you guys that took the time um, to sit down and to write those comments and those personal messages. A lot of comments on the music, on the music that I use. Now, I I've, I love music. I, I, um, um, I'm always searching for interesting things to use. And in the last couple of videos, I used a, a cover of, um, I think, one of my favorite songs of all time, uh, it's a Pink Floyd song called "Wish You Were Here," and I wanted to I wanted to talk about that a little bit because that's a, a song that has such a tremendous meaning. You know, we've all heard it, and uh, not everyone really listens to the lyrics of songs. You know, they have a catchy tune and it speaks to you or resonates some way, and and you like it. But um, I'm always interested in what's behind it. A lot of the music that I choose, it has a significant meaning uh, to me uh, that that applies to the video. Um, I oftentimes, before I even create the video, before I even turn on the camera, I have the music in my mind the whole time I'm shooting it, um, creating the video to conform to the music that I have that I've chosen. But I want to talk about this song a little bit, and and because it ties into so many things, the philosophy and and uh, our way of life, and and the reason why we decided to become modern homesteaders, to to move out of the city and to and to leave those jobs behind. And this song, I think, is really an anthem, and it speaks to that and uh, about about changes. And I don't know what the original intent was with this of this song was. I'm not a huge into the history of Pink Floyd. I just know what it means to me. But if you take the lyrics from the sen from the middle of the song, the song talks about trading something that's mediocre or actually kind of bad um, it, it, in exchange for something that could be really, really good or perhaps perhaps worse. And I'll read this, and I want to comment on this a little bit because it um, it's just it's one of the greatest songs ever written, and this is the reason why. He says, uh, or they say, and did you and and did they get you to trade your heroes for ghosts? 
Meanings, you know, I think we're very optimistic when we're younger and we have these ideas and I want to be a fighter pilot or I want to be a soldier. Or, I want to be a doctor. Or, I want to be a, I want to do something great. And he's, and as time goes on and, and the, the life crushes us and, and we give those things up, he's speaking to this. Did you trade those things that were heroes to you for ghosts? You know, what is the ghost but a shadow of a hero? Did you trade hot ashes for trees? Did you trade hot air for a cool breeze? Cold comfort for change. Now that is so poignant. Cold comfort. Can you really be comf- comfortable when you're cold? A cold comfort to me is something that is uh, somewhat comfortable, but all the while you're freezing and shivering, so it's not really comfortable for change. And what is the change? So what you would take a cold comfort and change it, and exchange that for change, because what does change mean? It could be change for something that's really great. You could take a chance and 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 to not accept that cold comfort, that that numb numb life, just going over the same ground, doing the same thing, waking up day after day, doing something that you don't really like, living in a place you don't really like, hanging around people that that you don't really like, because it's easy. Did you exchange this cold comfort for a change that could be good, or it could be bad? And the best part of this whole thing is, he says, and did you exchange a walk? on part in the war for a lead role in a cage you know it's dangerous to go to war you could be defeated you could even be killed or you could be victorious and you could become a hero and and and, and reach uh, you know and have accolades and for courageous deeds you know it's it's it is a war it's no guarantee that you're going to come out the other side but there's a possibility that something great could happen. And there's a risk that something terrible could happen. But do we exchange that, those possibilities, for a lead role in a cage? <laughs>